Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, do I need this one off? Is that, is that going to be a problem if we have them both? Okay. Can you hear me reasonably well? Okay. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and to talk to you about moral enhancement um, and, and really just the, the chance to be here with you um, on this occasion, thinking about your uh, foray into interdisciplinarity. Uh, it, it's really it, a very exciting place to be. I will try to not cause feedback as I'm doing so. But I, uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. But I do have a complaint, which is that you scheduled me after Professor LeBaron's <laughs> magnificent keynote speech. Um, and I, so uh, right off the bat, I will say I'm not going to compete. Um, and I don't really have that creativity thing. But I do have confetti, which she never reached for, even though she had this lovely creative speech. OK, so what I'm going to try to do is give you a sense of how we think about things uh, in the world of neuroethics. And neuroethics is a, is a new discipline, an interdisciplinary discipline in and of itself that arose only about 15 years ago. And um, the idea behind neuroethics is to examine the uh, so societal implications of really any kinds of advances in technology that affect our brains. And um, I take this in a very large umbrella kind of way. Traditionally, you, you might think of it um, as technologies that. <laughs> My battery is low. <laughs> uh, traditionally, you might think of um, technologies that affect our, our brains in terms of things in the clinic, so neurology, neurosurgery, things like that. But I'm much more interested in everyday life. And the reason that I'm interested in everyday life is because the issues that we deal with, that I like to deal with, affect thousands or millions or even billions of people on the planet, affecting us all. Because we're, we all, hopefully, everybody in the room, everybody, raise your hand if you have a brain. Yes, everybody has a brain. That's pretty good. We all have brains. And as you'll see, as I start talking about technology and its effects on our brains, we are all uh, subject to the effects of uh, technologies that have developed and the way that they change us and change us in fundamental ways. And Michelle was quite correct. My, I take a very brain-based view of who we are. And so when they change our brain, they change who we are in ways that are very, very important to us. And none of those is more important than morality. So let's start at the beginning. And if we start at the beginning, um, about 70,000 years ago, Homo sapiens emerged from Africa. Uh, and we Homo sapiens were relatively small, nimble creatures. We weren't particularly robust. We weren't really strong or anything like that. But what we had something that was really amazing. We had developed this adaptation called language. And with that adaptation called language, we were able to coordinate our activities between members of the species to say, oh, if you go out on that path today, you'll s I saw a snake around there, so be careful because there's a snake. Or behind that set of trees, I think I saw um, a deer. And maybe if we uh, find a way to, you can scare them out, and I'll go with my spear. And so that kind of coordination of activity was unprecedented in the history of evolution. Nobody had ever, no other species had ever been able to communicate on that kind of scale. Certainly, there's animal communication, but nothing quite like that. And so that made Homo sapiens very quickly the most successful species on the planet. And so they came out of Africa uh, around 70,000 
years ago, swept up through the Middle East and into Europe. And when they got to Europe, there they encountered the Neanderthals. Now, the Neanderthals were another species of genus Homo, who were quite a bit more robust, also had large brains, had uh, substantial cognitive uh, abilities, but from everything that we know, and of course, we're talking about evidence-based, I will admit that the evidence is not conclusive because nobody has spoken with a Neanderthal, but from everything that we know, they didn't have language. So they didn't have this ability to coordinate their activities in the way that Homo sapiens did. But there is some evidence, something that we do know, which is that not too long after Homo sapiens arrived, the Neanderthals were no more. It's necessarily a very pretty picture of our past. Some people suggest that it was the first real genocide. And the reason they suggest this is that homo, as Homo sapiens spread across the planet, they encountered other species uh, of Homo, because there were six or seven of them now that had been identified across the planet. And everywhere that Homo sapiens arrived, that other species disappeared within a relatively short period of time. So dawn of humanity, if you will, we had this amazing ability, language, which began to provide us with the, the opportunity to articulate concepts, to think about things in a way that probably doesn't occur in other species. But we were saddled with something that um, at least uh, all higher mammals have, which is in-group, out-group distinction. We'd encounter other species of uh, genus Homo, and they would be seen as an outgroup as opposed to us seen as an in-group. And this um, obviously had some evolutionary value, but we were saddled with this. And so I, I think that you can think of us at the earliest part of, of human civilization as not really having a very expansive moral palette that we were still relatively crude in the way that we thought about the world. And then the historical record gets pretty thin after 70,000 years ago because, well, we don't know exactly what happened. But we do know that somewhere around 2,500 years ago, people started getting serious about thinking about morality, what's right and what's wrong. And language had progressed, probably 2,500 years ago, people used much more complicated uh, forms of language than, than early Homo did 70,000 years ago. And three thinkers in particular articulated visions about morality that are worth considering. And the first person that, uh, so I, I'm a neurobiologist by training, but in neuroethics, you end up interacting with a lot of philosophers. And one thing that I learned from philosophers is that your talk always has some gravitas if you begin with Aristotle. And so I'm going to begin with Aristotle. And Aristotle um, really spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about what is morally correct, what are morally proper actions and what are morally improper actions. And his description of what constitutes the good life remains 2,500 years later worth reading because he really understood some things that are important and that would be relevant to us all. But the extent of his moral circle was not so great. For Aristotle, moral duty accrued to Athenian men, period, full stop. Women, no. Non-Athenians, no. Athenian men were accorded this incredible amount of moral duty, and the way he describes it, it's a beautiful thing, and it would be lovely if we all treated each other exactly the way that Aristotle wanted all Athenian men to be treated. But it was still a little constrained, and you can see the vestiges of this in-group, out-group uh, thing still happening there that we're Athenian men, and we are on top of the world, and actually they were kind of on top of the world, uh, 
And all these other groups, they're all um, somehow subhuman or be beneath our, our requirement for moral consideration. Now then there is another philosopher uh, uh, around the same time in, in a uh, region not far from here, Confucius, who also elaborated a very sophisticated more set of moral codes. I will admit, and especially since I'm here in Hong Kong, that I know probably much, 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 much less about uh, the teachings of Confucius than many of you. But what I do know is that he too had an idea of who you owed mor your moral duty to. And the, the highest moral duty was owed to the family. So uh, from that comes the, the whole uh, tradition of filial piety. And, um, and that has been a very influential uh, philosophy throughout Asia. But again, you can see that this it remains a different version of a vestige of the in-group and the out-group. And so that's the way that morality was seen uh, in Confucian view around 2,500 years ago. And there's a third um, philosophy that also developed around the same time, and that was that of the Buddha. And for the Buddha, um, the moral circle extended to all living beings. And it's the most expansive version of moral consideration that you can imagine. Now, I'm not going to talk about it, but I want you all to think about this later. Which of these is the right thing? It's a, actually a very difficult question for which nobody has a proper answer. How wide should our moral circles be? Because the further out you extend your moral consideration, perhaps it dilutes a little bit. Is there some limit that one should use? Well, how do we expend our moral resources to live on this planet in harmony so that we flourish not just as individuals but as societies and as societies now in the modern world that interact with other, obvious other, in everyday experience. So this is, is a, a very real question for us. It is the source of really all conflicts that we talk about, whether those conflicts are wars, whether those conflicts are marital conflicts, any sort of situation like that, um, you have to think about who is extending moral consideration to whom and how they are doing it. So I, I'm hopeful that some of what I'm going to talk about is relevant to your thinking about mediation and, uh, in the small sense, let's say, between a couple of people or in the larger sense when you solve the problems of world peace. Okay, so um, in the intervening 2,500 years, of course, I think that we moved our morality a, a reasonable amount. It's not the case anymore that we accord our, uh, our, our, moral, our moral consideration only for adult men of our particular state or only to our families. But it's also not the case that we uh, spread it wide across the entire world. I think that we're, we're working to find a happy medium. And how have we done that? What kind of moral education have we developed over the last 2,500 years? And I, I think my answer is not very good. I don't, I don't think we've attended to systematic education extremely well. One of the ways that we've done this is certainly through religious teachings. So religions have been a, um, afforded with the um, opportunity and the responsibility to be moral forces in the world, but they also tend to devolve very quickly into in-group and out-group sorts of situations. And certainly in the, as we have moved to a more secular world, the influence of religion on moral education 
has diminished, or has diminished, not disappeared. Um, I think actually the biggest source of moral education have been stories. And those stories have been in books and movies around the fireside, or the, the, the sort of thinking around uh, stories at, around the hearth. Today on YouTube videos, if you think about the whole array of fictional, mostly, or sometimes non-fictional stories, there's usually a morality play involved. And so we rehearse through watching and reading, watching uh, movies or reading stories, what is right and what is wrong. Should he have denied that person some food or should he not have denied that? Was that a, a correct action or not? And we continually evaluate that. And as we evaluate that, we learn our morality. So I think that, that books and movies have been a, a really great source of moral education, but they're not a very systematic way of becoming a more moral person. It's just the way that we are uh, at, th that we have arrived where we have arrived. It's an interesting question as to whether we should give, uh, develop serious moral education for us as a populace, not just for young people, but for us as a populace. But we'll come back. Okay. So in 1981, thinking about these issues, the philosopher Peter Singer, who's a strong utilitarian, uh, described and really brought attention to this question of expanding the moral circle. And for those of you who don't know, uh, before, just uh, not too many years before this, Peter Singer was famous for beginning, really, the animal rights movement and uh, was the first to draw great attention to the fact that animals may have rights to and we should uh, bring some moral consideration to animals. But what's important about this book is that he suggested that the way that we expand our moral circle is via rational thinking, that we could rationally think our way through, we could weigh the pluses and minuses of according uh, 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 moral um, competence, if you will, uh, or moral consideration to this particular situation or that particular situation, and that's all we needed, just to rationally think it through and we would be just fine. Well, I'm not sure that that's um, the whole story. Certainly it's true, because I, I told you that I have a brain-based view of the world, so of course I'm gonna go to the brain pretty quickly. Uh, Certainly rational thinking is something that goes on in our brains. But when we watch those YouTube videos, when we think about those morality plays, when we uh, uh, experience those moral impulses, it's not just rationality that comes to play. There's emotion that fits in as well. And there's um, one particular emotion called empathy that plays a big role role. And so let's just ask for a second, what is this thing called empathy? Empathy is the ability to not just notice the plight of others, but actually also to feel the plight of others. And often we feel that to, um, to play off of Michelle's suggestion, we feel it in a very embodied sense. Now, my take is that um, that all comes from our brains, feeling that, but it doesn't really matter the locus. The point is that when you feel that, the plight of others, as it, if it were your own, that is the motivation that you have to act, to help them in some way, or to consider them as, oh my, that's a human being as well, and therefore they are due moral consideration. Now, I want to take a second here and just clarify what I mean by an emotion, because people tend to think, oh, that's not rational thinking. That's this fuzzy something or other uh, that you see my hands waving in the air, that that's what we do when we think about emotions. But if you think about emotions, just generally, empathy included, where do they hap they're happen in our brains? We may feel some embodied sensations, but they occur in our brains. And the way that they occur is that either 
through some evolutionary heritage or through some past experience, we learn that under a certain cir circumstance, this is a reasonable response that gets us to a solution that is probably approximately correct. May not be totally reasoned out, but it's a good approximation of a solution. And we develop that, we embed that in our brains as a heuristic, as a shortcut to that probably approximately correct solution. And then when we encounter it the next time, so you encounter somebody who's in pain, or your, um, your partner um, says something that makes you angry, you arrive at that state, anger or empathy or whatever, quickly. And now you have your solution. You don't have to think it through. You don't have to expend cognitive energy for all that. You efficiently arrive at that solution. And that's what emotions really are. They're an efficient means of arriving at a probably approximately correct solution. It doesn't mean that you have no cognitive resources to think about whether that probably approximately correct solution is appropriate in this context. It just means that it guides you in the right spot. And that's what empathy really does. And it does so about very important moral considerations. Okay, so now let's delve a little deeper into of the um, neurobiology that underlies uh, modern empathy. So on the, uh, let's see, on, on, the, uh, on your left, on the left-hand side of the screen are prairie voles, and on the right-hand side of the screen, meadow voles. Now, um, I want you to raise your hand if you can tell the difference between the two by looking up at the screen. Really? Nobody can tell the difference? Very, very, <laughs> these are very different cousins. They're cousins, they, they're, they're, they're really very closely related species, and they live out in the grasslands eating seeds and things like that. But prairie voles, and it's totally evident in the photo, I, I can't imagine that you can't see this, prairie voles are monogamous. They mate for life. And after mating, the male stays around and helps to take care of the upbringing of the pups. Uh, meadow voles, on the other hand, are promiscuous. The males mate, they go off into the field, they do whatever they're going to do, they collect some more seeds, the female stays behind, takes care of the pups, and that's the way it works. Well, it turns out that this is a great um, uh, example, a, a great opportunity to study uh, this, this set of behaviors, which are called affiliative behaviors. And neurobiologists um, realized this opportunity and they started to study them and they found that there's a difference between uh, prairie voles and meadow voles that was remarkable, which is that the distribution of the neuropeptide oxytocin along with vasopressin is quite different in the brains of male uh, prairie voles versus voles. And in fact, if you go in and you molecularly uh, muck around with the brains of the male prairie voles and you remove the oxytocin, now they're gonna be promiscuous. And if you go in and you add oxytocin to the, the brains of male meadow voles, now they will be monogamous and mate for life. It's kind of a, it's a beautiful set of experiments and very strong empirical data uh, replicated in, in many studies very elegant techniques. And from that came this idea that oxytocin uh, what might be useful in other realms. And it, about a dozen years ago, in a collaboration between some psychologists and some economists, so this is the kind of interdisciplinary research that you people are talking about, a, a, a very amazing study was, was done. And what they suggested from this was that oxytocin promotes trust. And let me tell you a little bit about the experiment. It's a pretty cool experiment. So the idea is that, um, let's say, uh, you, I, I need two people who are going to participate. Just raise your hand again. You, you don't have to do anything more than raise your hand. Okay, we have one over there, and then I want somebody from over this side. Just somebody raise your hand. Okay, great. Okay, so you're the you're going to be the person to whom I'm going to give the money. Okay, I'm going to give you $100. Okay, 
Okay, and you really get to keep the hundred dollars in these experiments. So you can your pocket. But I tell you, you can give as much or as little of your hundred dollars to this individual over here. And if you give, let's say, ten dollars, I'm going to triple it. So I'm going to add thirty dollars to the pot. So now there's a hundred and forty dollars, and then you get to decide how much of that you're going to give back. So now imagine the scenario, if you give all of your $100 over, so now I'm gonna add $300, now there's $400, you give $200 back, you both get $200. That sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? Well, it turns out that people do this calculation in their heads because, of course, you don't have to give any of that $400 back. You can keep all of $400. So, Maybe you shouldn't give any of it, back, anything over there, because you could start out with $100, and you just walk away, and you have $100. This person doesn't really mind. So that's the, the way the experiment went. Except before I give you the $100, I take a little spray bottle of oxytocin, and it turns out you can spray oxytocin into people's noses, and it passes through the blood-brain barrier and into their brain. And so a little spray bottle, either with oxytocin or just the placebo, so I don't know and you don't know what you've gotten, but when you do that, then the amount of money that you're willing to entrust with, your, uh, with another person goes up quite significantly. Uh, it's really, a, it was a remarkable experiment and it rocked the field that you could do this, that you could change the ability of people to trust other people just by spraying something in their nose. Well, uh, out of that came the idea that oxytocin is the trust chemical. And this became a crazy story, and many, many studies emerged. And since you're talking about empirical research, I will tell you that some of them were maybe not so good. And in fact, a lot of bad science got published. Some good science got published. People who didn't confirm their effects or found no effects, didn't publish at all, which of course you need to publish all of the studies even when it doesn't work because how do we know if we're only publishing the positive studies? Anyway, it's been a poster child for um, how to do empirical research well and how to do empirical research badly. Uh, and probably the best view now of what oxytocin does is that it's not, it doesn't put trust into you but it, it probably does make you more aware of social interactions in a general sense, and that translates in certain situations, like a neuroeconomic gain, into um, greater trust. And um, even though it has been attacked fiercely and terribly, um, the phenomenon persists, and just this year, it's a really interesting, again, a, a kind of neuroeconomic study. Um, in Germany, as you know, it's been in all the headlines, there's been a huge problem. They've had an influx of millions of refugees. Uh, really, it's, it's a, well, maybe not millions, many, many thousands. I'm not quite sure of the numbers. That's not my job. Uh, but what uh, these uh, scientists did is they thought, this is a very interesting opportunity to think about how oxytocin might work. And so they played another one of these economic games and they gave people a game, um, they gave them $50 and they gave them 50 categories of the needs of poor people. So food, shelter, housing, clothing, um, coffee, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So they had 50 categories and you could tick off each category that you wanted to donate to except it would be one, one euro. So this is all done in euros. It would be one of your euros, and you would walk away with fewer euros. So again, going back to the way that it happened before, you could just say, well, I'm not giving anything to anybody. I'm just going to take the 50 euros, and thank you very much for including me in the experiment. Um, and so they did this, and of course, again, they either sprayed a placebo or oxytocin into the noses of these people. And what you can see on the very left is that when the people to whom they were giving were poor Germans, native Germans, oxytocin did exactly what it was supposed to do. So in blue is the placebo and in orange is the oxytocin. 
they gave more euros. They, they were more giving. They, they went up from two and a half to six euros. That's a pretty, pretty nice increase. And interestingly, the exact same thing happened with refugees. They gave more to these refugees than they, uh, than they gave uh, when there was a placebo. And so in both the in-group and the out-group situation, they were more generous. But what is also obvious on the slide, and probably many of you have already figured it out, is that they did an additional manipulation, which is that they had tested all these people for their xenophobic attitudes. And people who were uh, low on a xenophobic scale, oxytocin, it did exactly what you expected. But people who were xenophobic, people who didn't really like other, it didn't affect them at all. Their, their positions were hardened. The, this increasing sensitivity to social situations that people think about for oxytocin just didn't change their willingness to give, their willingness to uh, deal with this refugee problem. They felt hardened to it, and they weren't, were going to walk away many of the 50 euros as possible just on their own. So the oxytocin story persists. And because of stories like this and a few others, this idea that we can change our trust, change our moral sense with modern technology, some philosophers, particularly a group of philosophers at Oxford, have begun to suggest over the last half dozen years that moral bioenhancement is something that we need on this planet. That, in fact, the, the titles of the papers go something like the urgent need to bioenhance the populace. And they're not content with just saying, well, this is a good thought experiment. They suggest, actually, that we might give serious consideration to putting it in the drinking water the same way that we put fluoride in to strengthen our teeth. That we should compulsorily, morally bioenhance the entire population. Now, this has been, to say the least, a contentious discussion within the field of neuroethics because the idea of improving the morality, uh, like what could be wrong with that? Why would you not want to make people more moral? But then the compulsory side to it, and then whose morals? Like the oxytocin morals? I'm not sure that's the right morals, but how do you get to this? But so they don't, it's not so much oxytocin, it's more a matter of saying neurobiology is developing incredible tools to change our, our brains, and, and since morality occurs in our brains, we are going to have soon even more powerful tools to do this, and we should be ready for it, and this is how we should deploy it. So I think everything is correct. We, neuroscience is developing those tools. Soon we will have more powerful tools, but then there's the question of how should we deploy it. And so um, together with uh, Jonas Specker and Margie Shermer from uh, uh, Rotterdam University, we set out to test to ask a question, well, how do people think about moral enhancement? In particular, how do they think about moral bioenhancement? And so we did an empirical study, because uh, really what I do most of all is do studies of public attitudes. And so what we had is we had one group of people, let's say this side of the room, it was about 100 people, and they read a vignette, and this is the following this is the vignette, and I, I apologize for uh, a wall of words that you're going to see, but I'm going to have to read it to you. So you imagine that your 13-year-old child is being bullied by another student at school. Uh, the school has a program that's been shown to be effective, it reduces bullying, and the program involves the following. Over the course of four weeks, every day the bully takes a pill that increases empathy for others. Because we know that the oxytocin story is reasonably well known and reasonably plausible, even though all of you know that, well, maybe it's not so true. Um, the pill is based on the natural hormone oxytocin, and it improves the bully's ability to understand what other people are feeling. We tell them that studies have shown that the program reduces bullying by 40%. No side effects, don't worry about that. 
The reduction in bullying persists for six months after the program is complete. So 100 people read that story, and that's all that they know. Then we take another group of 100 people, completely separate group of people, and we give them the same story except for one little change, which is that instead of taking oxytocin, now the bully plays a video game that increases empathy for others, and the video game is based on best educational practices. It improves the bully's ability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So we have two groups of people. One has read the oxytocin story, one has read the video game story, and then everybody ends up being asked the same question. And the question is, to what degree do you think that it would be a good idea for the bully to participate in a program like the one described above? So I want everybody on this side of the room to imagine that you read the oxytocin story, and I want everybody on this side of the room to imagine that you read the video game story. And you just have to think about this in your head. I'm not going to test you on it. I'm not going to ask you what your numbers are, but I'm going to tell you what the population says, because we tested this on a lot of people. And the surprise that people did not like the idea of having the bully participate in this program. But they really liked the idea of the, this bully participating in the video uh, program. Of course, it's not the only question that we asked them. We didn't do all this fast. One question, what we do is we ask kind of a, moral, a, a set of escalatingly morally challenging questions. So the first question was just participation. And then the next question was, well, what if it was mandatory? What if the bully had to participate in this program? And of course, they liked the oxytocin even less. And actually, the, the video game, it, the, people don't like this mandatory stuff. So then we asked them another question. Well, what if, it was what if we had a test where we could predict who was going to be a bully and who was not? Now, that's, uh, that's kind of interesting and complicated moral grounds. And only those who were um, going to be a bully we would do this with. And sure enough, we had the same, no, they don't really like that oxytocin thing. They, they didn't like the preventative video game uh, very much either. And then finally, the, the fourth was, well, what if we just, what, why don't we just morally enhance all the kids? Like, all, everybody knows that kids are just terrible anyway, so let's just morally enhance them all. What do you think of that? We'll give them all, all oxytocin, or at least we'll put them in front of the video game. And they really didn't like the oxytocin, but actually, it's important to note, they kind of liked the idea of video games. And I, I won't go into it with you, but after asking these questions, we, we had a free response box, and we asked them to tell us, in your own words, why you answered as you did. And they did tell us, because people had strong opinions about this. And they loved the idea of some kind of program for children that taught them morality, that this would be required, that we're missing this, that we don't really have any systematic way of doing this, and this is an important thing to do. And when we analyzed all of these pre-response answers, the key thing that came up was that this is about character. This is about building character in, in people and uh, producing a, a, a long-lasting, enduring change in their morality, whereas uh, spraying some oxytocin, giving them an oxytocin pill or anything like that, that's just kind of an artificial version of morality. And we don't want this sort of artificial morality, we want the real thing. So if you think about this uh, for a moment, so that, that's, a, that's a very deep version, but now I want to bring it to what you people work on. I want to challenge you a little bit, because that, that's a certain context. Bullying in schools, these are people who are going to go on out into the world. But now I want to ask you a question, and this is your take-home work. What about if two people are trying to find their way to an agreement. And they're at an impasse. And as we've heard, when they're at an impasse, they're stuck in some way. And they're stuck in, and they know they're stuck, and they want an agreement. What if they were to take a pill that would expand their moral circle to include the other side of the negotiating? Is there something ethically problematic with that? I dare say that that's a really challenging question. So now, instead of this idea that the Oxford neuroethicists have of morally enhancing the
the world, um, not talking about selectively offering, not requiring, but offering the opportunity for individuals to morally enhance themselves. What if a stepfather wanted to bond with his stepson? And he knew that, that the statistics are that stepfathers beat their stepsons much more so than fathers beat sons, or something like that. And he wanted to improve that bond. And so he decided that he wanted to take a pill. Is there something problematic with that? I think the answer is generally, well, maybe not too bad, but it's still kind of a, that gets into a fuzzy area. And the minute that you say, oh, I don't really know, I, I can see the plus and minus, you know you're right at the edge where you want to be. And that's where you want to think about things. It's easy to say we don't want to put oxytocin in the, in the drinking water. It's a lot more challenging to think about what we're going to do about negotiating. And because I told you earlier, um, neuroscience is moving along quickly. These tools are going to be ever more available as time goes on. And so you, in thinking about your practice, may very well be confronted with thinking more deeply about using these sort of tools or offering them to your clients in concert with a psychologist or a psychiatrist or something like that so that they can come to some kind of agreement. And so it presents a, a real opportunity, I think, for this interdisciplinary program, thinking about how neuroscience will interact in the not too distant future with um, this whole idea of negotiating conflict resolution in new and creative ways that may be ethically challenging for you. And I can tell you they're deeply ethically challenging for me, but when you think about moral enhancement in the past, in the present, now you have to think about it in the future. And now that I've made everybody uncomfortable, I think I'm gonna stop right there. <laughs> and thank you for your attention.